I'll, I'll start, but to okay. be honest, I so okay. Um, I gave a conference. I gave a talk at a conference about the app that I've been working on for work. So I can show you all the app, but I really wanted to talk about how I wanted to show you the behind the scenes journey of like the back end and how much better it is. And like everyone at work doesn't give a shit about that, you know, cause they're just like, it still works. But I'm like, no, we have custom S3 classes and we got this and we got that. But I work for, um, I work for, I'm a contractor, but this is for Biogen and they are a clinical trial company, not a software company. So they don't know what license to put <laughs> the app out there. So this has been months of like learning what a GPL is. And I'm like, I didn't go to law school. Right. So anyways, uh, this is a long winded version of me saying like, I could show the front end of what I built, but like, it's not as cool as I just wanted to share with everyone that I, so this, maybe I will just share it, screw it. Okay. Because we, we could talk about what I did and then I'll share the code once it's like a thing. <laughs> um, share what you're comfortable sharing. Don't share any more than that. <laughs> you have to enable sharing. Oh, wait, I have to, um, what do I do? I do there. I'm just allowing everyone to share screen. So in theory, okay. so let me know when you can see it. Can see it. This is a shiny app. <laughs> um, you can theoretically upload data here, but in this dummy app, we're using open source data because you're not just going to like, show patient data on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, but what I wanted to share with you guys is you have these different data frames that are very mergeable on keys. So they all share the subject IDs. So this file has like metadata with a patient, age, sex, things are not that are not gonna change throughout the study. And these guys have the, um, attributes that are measured throughout the course of the study. So what I built was this drag and drop GT table. So you can take any column. So these are those data sets, but now we turn them into little blocks. Um, and you can drag in this numeric column and then a mean block and calculate at week 20, at week 12, we get the mean, some basic summary statistics. So this is non-standard evaluation because you, you're you doing this um, pipe only when these two are connected to each other. And then, and that's like all my questions in the Slack about like doing all these mutate shenanigans, <laughs> holding on to it and then evaluating later. And then um, what else is cool is how you're calculating these statistics is going to change based on the data frame that you came from. And what I did there, and I don't know if this is the best approach, is when you creating these little blocks, not, this is, you know, D ply R, summarize, mean, DIABP, right? Um, but it's really, I created custom S3 classes because the, this mean function is a little bit a different flavor for each of these data frames. So what I did, and the data frames always have the same names. So we can leverage that and data frames have the same column names. So that's like each study is its own snowflake, but there are these consistent, consistencies that we can leverage. So I kind of did like mean dot ADVS, mean dot ADLBC. <laughs> so that way this, this guy has the attribute of the data frame that it came from. And now we know how to do this calculation on it. And then I'm, I can just like 
flex some stuff like oh we can also like group our data in real time and you know it's it's i think it's a pretty cool app i haven't but i'm obviously biased and i'm sorry i can't show you like something that i've learned from this book club and as i'm working at this company is like everyone says it's important to learn git and like know what git is but like I never really understood the importance of a commit message and how <laughs> you can use your commits to kind of tell a story. So now, like, I can, I, when that is open, I'll share it with the Slack and show you, like, how this went from, like, gar like hot steaming garbage to just regular garbage. So I'm, but I'm really, <laughs> I'm really proud of this. And there's, it's, it's just really cool because you, I've refactored every line of this code because of the book club. So that's kind of my lightning round, what I wanted to share. Ta -da. Yeah, that's awesome. I keep wondering, like, are you rebuilding tidy blocks? I couldn't figure out why you kept asking the same vein of questions all the time. And I was like, you you built tidy blocks not in R, so I don't understand how you keep asking the same questions if you're not rebuilding it in R. And I so, realized, oh, you're doing it here. Side yeah. note, also doing that. Um, I I've took a quick quick detour to learn how to make an HTML widget, which we did not cover in this book club. But now that I know how to do that and have the blocks and stuff, um, that's going to be exactly like all that. It's going to be Arling cr craziness because you have to see what blocks are present and then how you're going to evaluate those blocks. Um, maybe, but yeah, I, I don't know. I kind of know what Arling is now. It's pretty, it's pretty powerful. It seems like your use case was like perfect for the book or the book was perfect for your, your use case. And you're doing a lot of things dynamically, uh, you know, be able to control things, store metadata. It's uh, like, yeah, yeah. I knew, I knew, I knew I had to read this book and I'm, <laughs> and we did it. <laughs> and so she got us all to read it. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. Unintentional benefits. <laughs> no, very intentional. <laughs> that, you, you, like you got what you wanted out of it, but then you made all of us do it as well, and so now we're all better for it. We love it. It's very cool. Yeah, Tony, right. you're joking in the comments like Git commit fix everything, but it's I don't know. I still do that. I still like I'll just at the end of the day, I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot to commit everything today. Let me just say, you know. <laughs> I like you know done doing this today, but I'm, I'm terrible with it. See, one of the things that I learned out of like doing the package part was that my commit messages didn't matter to me as much because I set out all of my stuff as issues, and so every time it committed, and then I would make a pull request, I'd like link the issue that it solved, so I didn't have to go looking for that message. It just goes, yeah, it closed this. this oh, message. I like that. Yeah, but you're smart. You know, like not everyone is like organized like that. Yeah. You know? Well, no, I'm I, I my so my git so like I do git add dot and then git commit m and that's like you know it solves it just like pushes everything through. I'm also guilty of that. Yeah, but, but I like your issue workflow, and I don't maybe like like where did you come up with that? And I don't think that's written down anywhere for like people that are n newer. I don't know where I picked it up specifically, but it came out of, I think, I was reading some, I'll, I'll look for it, I'll see if I can find it, but like I was reading on how to use Git, like, projects. I mean, was it, was it Jenny? It was possibly Jenny, <laughs> it was very probably Jenny, if not, but like, no, I think it was like Emily Reader or whatever was having like a Git projects oh. workflow or some kind of project manager in it. But I didn't actually like download the package and use it. I just kind of like, oh, you may just make an issue. Just like, it would be nice if this did this, right? And I think like having John, kind of seeing John's stuff on Mendor Dash and like, it should do this. 
And so just setting all of those things out as issues, like that was way before I started doing it. And then somewhere along the line, I picked up the idea like, okay, so it's now a project board. You can like map it as you're moving it there. And then you know, when you Move attach on. the issue to a pull request, it like moves it into like a to do thing. Or like mm -hmm. if you close this pull request, it will solve this issue. And then like automate closes all the issues. And you know, when you merge the pull request in. So I think that's. Yeah, I haven't fully adopted Git projects yet because we use Jira at work yeah. and so I only partly use Git but I don't know that we should use Jira like I don't think we get anything out of it instead of just using Git so yeah. one of these days yeah and I think like oh the other thing is my work like I work I use DevOps with Azure which has is it which is like its own mm -hmm. Git repository and so on and they do things by tracking issues <laughs> um, although not in ours so I never look at any of their stuff so <laughs> <laughs> or just the side effects of picking stuff up. But uh, yeah, Git's interesting. And I love the uh, obligatory XKCD that Jonathan shared. <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's an XKCD about everything. <laughs> uh, that's great. All right. How am I taking? So, and was that, did you show us everything you, you think you can show us, Maya? Yeah, pass, next. All right. <laughs> well, who's next? I guess I can, I'll go ahead and go. Let me, let me put this on the right screen. Um, so mine um, is, oops. It's uh, somewhat minor, but it was it, it came at the right time that um, two, two, two. Um, one of my coworkers, uh, Jonathan Bratt, who's occasionally uh, also on R4DS, was doing something with one of the packages that um, mostly I wrote. And he was like, ah, oh, this, like, it's fast, but it needs to be crazy fast. It's slowing down. Like I run it, I run this one function like a million times a day. Is there anything we can do? I'm, I think I'm going to have to just cut it out. And I was like, oh no, you can't just cut it out. I'm going to, I'm going to fix that. Um, and so for a little background, the package is just, we, in a lot of our, so we do almost all of our, all of our work in our packages and we um, are a little eh, sometimes obsessive about typing of our uh, parameters. So for example, I type L for integers, as we saw earlier in the chats. Um, and we have a whole package that is like the first step of all of our functions is we check that the variables are what we expect them to be and do some coercion because R normally does coercion, but we want it to do it logically. Like for example, if you feed 1.1 into something that's expecting an integer, most of the time R just turns it into one, doesn't even tell you that it did it. And uh, okay, it's fine. It just, it, that you meant one, but I sent you 1.1. So probably I didn't mean one and I wanna catch that. And so we ex have all these explicit, explicit checks that only let things through. Like if you send me one, I wanna just let that through. You don't, I'm not gonna make you type one L but if you send 1.1, I don't just let that through because that's not the same thing as one. Does that part make sense for the motivation behind all this? And so this is all depending what you send me. If you send me an int and you tell me that you want an int, then I should just say, okay, cool. That's good and send it back. But if you send me a character, I need to do a certain, a different process. And if you send me an, a double, then I have to do a different process. And so clearly that should be S3. And so, oh, and I wanted to show, see, I, I have messages that actually mean something, but this is all uh, stupid zeros. I had bugs with, with zeros on this because turns out uh, 5.0 will convert to five, but then it doesn't, they're not equal anymore. And uh, it, it caused, that caused some problems before. So anyway, um, so we had, I had this, uh, <laughs> this thing, darn it. What? Oh, that's just a new tab that I opened. 
So this was the code. This is an example function from this package. Oops, let's just go down to... Uh, um, this is the one that you send in a character and there's some formatting problems in this. This is the old version. And it was this big, ugly uh, block of code and it calls this other function that does most of the work. And even for character, which is like the easiest one because characters are characters are characters. I don't care if you send me 1.1, I'm gonna say, okay, that's a character of 1.1. Um, but this one was this big, ugly function. And then post uh, R or post advanced R, it is each one of them is now this pretty use method validate character. And then I've got, oops, validate character dot character that it just, it does, there are these checks that we always do to see if we allow NAs and if we allow nulls and to allow you to pass through a specific error message and to say whether you require names. Um, so that, you know, it still runs that check. But that's all it has to do. If it's a character, if it's a list, in these functions, we flatten it. We try to flatten it into a character vector. And so it, there's this, this squish list then validate that I do that squishes it down into a vector if it can. Um, and it sends you know specific error messages. A big part of the whole point of this is that we want our error messages to say, this failed because you sent me a list and I was expecting a character or what, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so anyway, it's uh, it's all like it, I made all these separate versions of it uh, based on what you're sending me in through S3, and I don't have the speed test handy, but it cut it down by a factor of like a thousand. It was insane, <laughs> and so uh, that thing that Jonathan was running every day literally went from something that took him over an hour to something that took him like under a minute. Um, because of this book. So that was cool. So it, it sped it up by only doing the method that is necessary? Yes. And part of it was that, you know, most of the time when we're calling this function, this is all it has to do. Right. Um, but to do just that, it had to go through all this other stuff in the old version to get to the part where we go, oh, it's fine. Just send it back because it was messy. <laughs> now it's much okay, so less messy. Question from looking at this code that I've started to like kind of think about. If I see a like this crazy decision tree situation of like if else, if, if, if else, if this, then this, is that a good red flag for um, maybe you should consider S3? If your big decision trees are classes, then almost definitely. Um, and keeping in mind that null is a class, um, like parentheses is a class. <laughs> so there are some things that you might, you know, it might not immediately feel like it's a class decision, but sometimes it is. And I mean, this is a very, very specific use case because this whole package is all about like, check that the class is what you think it is. So, mm -hmm. Of course, S3s make sense for that. Um, but yeah. You can make I, custom classes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you can create new classes for sure. But sometimes create assigning that class will be as much work as you're like removing, possibly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, it can be. And yes, there are other idiosyncrasies in our code for sure. We explicitly return all the time because that way you know that, okay, this is the end. Um, so we always do explicit returns, even though R doesn't actually care about that. Um, and all of our internal functions are prefixed with a dot. So you can see this and know that that's not an exported function from this package. That's yep. beautiful. <laughs> why, why not pass the dots here? Uh, you know, like to have... Oh. Um, because passing dots um, can be meth messy with the uh, S3s, depending some of the, it, partly because I, I made a template and then I copied this many times for different versions of these functions. And this one probably passing the dots would have been fun, fine, but other ones it's not. 
Um, and so I do it explicitly because that's what's in my template. There are cases like that is a problem with using S3 is there are cases where like the order of the arguments can change during dispatch. And so it can be dangerous to just pass dots. It, um, well, oh, and I guess the other part of that is that I, you know, I want uh, the help to be helpful. And so I want to, I hate it when the, the help just says the arguments to this function are dot, 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 additional methods passed to, or additional parameters passed to methods. It's like, no, screw you, but what are the actual parameters? Well, that's a documentation problem. Yeah, but like that's... that's... Like you, can, you can assign, you know, like, in your, like, our, our option, you can do, like, dot, 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 and then, like, list all the other options that go with that, right? Like, that's not necessarily a dots. That's not the fault of the dots to me. But what if you don't write documentation? Then it's hard. Oh yeah, but we we also yeah. But if you're writing a bunch of these dots, you probably want to take write a you want to write it like with, if you're going to document it at all, which is like you know any of the arguments you're going to document it, then you should have like you should document the dots as something. Yeah. Um. But uh, I mean, we also have formal methods for, or formal rules for how we document. So in this case, it was easier not to just pass the dots to call everything out. And uh, documentation becomes easy because all these arguments are just in this uh, generic, or not generic, but this uh, non-specific validate vector function that has all those arguments. I mean, it is also a generic, but um, yeah. <laughs> John, do you have a blog? <laughs> Technically, yes. I just uh, I feel like when I was looking up, like Googling S3 <laughs> examples and like use cases, there's not like a lot out there. And I feel like this is so neat, like your before and after story. Um that's not not a bad idea. So technically, uh, not trying to give you more. Similar work, to what I you just said, like I love this. So this technically is not open, but I just decided to show you guys anyway. Got it. Um, one of these days, I need to like basically decide if I want to drastically change anything before doing so. But then we'll probably open up this particular package because. That's fair. Um, if anyone else cares, <laughs> then they're welcome to use our uh, very strict typing system. And actually, I say strict. It's not really strict. It's just that it's um, explicit about how it waves hands. So like if you send in, you know, if you have a vector that's um, a double vector, one, 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 two, three, four point seven, then it will say, oh, nope. I can't coerce that to integer because one of you isn't an integer. But if all of them happen to be, like even if you had 1.0000000, it says, okay, that's an, that's integer enough, close enough to an integer, and it doesn't throw errors. Um, it will warn you that it coerced, but it doesn't error out. And that's uh, probably uh, we would have to go find the generic checks function to show you that part. And I can probably do that. Um, uh, right there. Um, oh, and that's not that part actually, cause that's more explicit, but it does a, uh, does some, some standard checks, um, I don't remember what check length does. Uh, check that primer has length, right. <laughs> it's not a length of zero because we wanted to explicitly reject in almost all cases. Like if you're, if I expect a character and you give me character zero, you didn't really give me a character for a lot of the stuff we do. And so we deal with that explicitly as well. Um, so yes, technically is character true, but it's a character that will not, you know, it'll fail in unexpected ways. So we, make you tell us that it's okay that it has zero length. So. That's it.
I'm going to hand it back off. Who's next? Uh, I'll, I'll do one. Um, I, it's not really anything impressive or anything. I just wrote, let's see. Such a hustler starting it with that. <laughs> and then... No, it's, it's, it's literally like bare bones coming here. Uh, not impressive. I made a LaTeX DSO. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not spending my time doing that. That's uh, that's funny, by the way, uh, Tony. That is integer-ish. Number one, like I said before, we totally need a book club that just goes through all of our line. And uh, I totally have a function that is um, is integer-like that I'm guessing is exactly the same thing. So, <laughs> yep. <laughs> Um, so all I was going to show here is just a, a function factory to time mm. the runtime of functions. I guess I, I just had a project where there's just always like a bunch of queries that are run and, uh, you know, they take, you know, can take anywhere from one minute to like 30 minutes. Um, and there's like tons of queries that run and it's just a project that it, like I kick it off and it takes like two days to run entire over the, you know, the entire time span. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, track how the progress was so all like the self components as it's going through it. Uh, so just a simple thing to time the query. Uh, so really it's like, I guess this time it function is the main thing. I had this helper inform function to like do some pretty printing, I guess. Uh, and then, you know, yeah, it's just a function factory really that, you know, if you don't provide the name of your function, it's able to look in the from the, at the syscall and say, okay, what's the name of your function and print that out. So if I just, uh, you know, wrap my function up one here, just returning hello world and, and then call it, you know, uh, it tells, but I need to fix this extra duplicate thing. But here I'm looking at, you know, the time it started, the time it ended, and then approximately how long it took. And yeah, that's it. <laughs> it's just really a function factory for timing. Things. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, something like that amazing. didn't do, doesn't blah, blah. something like that doesn't exist already. I think probably there does there there is something that exists like it. It just I kind of like highlighting the time and stuff. Like I don't know if there's something that'll. Oh yeah, that's fancy. Yeah. Uh, and then also I just didn't want it to provide and yeah I wanted to tell me what function was running at the time so this prints out name of the function is without you having to like, type something. Do you run the timer on a single function or you can run it like on a whole R script and it'll take you as long, it'll tell you how long each one? Uh, it's usually just on a single function. Like you use it kind of like uh, a safely, quietly or memoize, uh, just wrap around a single function and it doesn't change anything about it, just uh, as a side effects. Yeah, that was it. I think the other thing from this book I learned, or what I really do a lot more now is the safely, quietly, those per adverbs, uh, and also yeah. using memoization. Uh, I sometimes got caught off guard with the memoization where the code doesn't change, but like the underlying data, it's trying to look like pulls in, does change. So if the function is cached and it doesn't go recheck what the data is because the code didn't change, but the data did change. That's the only like catch all with the memoize. It's not really an issue with that function, but uh, just knowing <laughs> that. But yeah, that's, those are, I, mean, I just do a lot of functional programming. So it's, unfortunately I can't, I don't know, I'm not applying every single thing we learned across the book, but you know, I, I, I'd like to think it made me overall a better programmer. That's it. I'm muted. Oops. But that was very cool. Um, I feel like it should be an adverb, though. Like, oh, uh, yeah, it should be. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, and like, timely is a word that ends in ly, but it's not, it, I don't know that it really works, but you should timely. Uh, measurably. Time. Measurably. <laughs> yeah. Uh, slowly? No. I mean, that's. <laughs> Um, yeah, I yeah. don't know. I have to come up with one. That's that's a good idea. Quantifiably. 
<laughs> Quantifiably F1. Yes. Very cool. <laughs> yes. All right. So Tan, what do you what do you have? What have you done? Yeah, well, a lot. So um you may I'm gonna share my wait. I have to do the last minute check of making sure I haven't left anything open and we're good. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I made a thing. Uh, so I was like trying to figure out what I learned and it kind of grew into a very long list of things that I do now. So I'll go through the list and then I'll kind of <laughs> show you like, so like the very first thing, like the overall thing, like. I, the reason why I joined the book club, um, aside from being, you know, FOMO and all that other fun social reasons, is because I wanted, every time I come, came back to Advanced R, um, I wanted to learn how to do, like, how to, like, meta program. Like, this whole idea of, like, what you want to do is meta programming. You need, like, you know, bang, bang, as, as you would, I would say <laughs> now. Um, and you need to do, like, end quote, quote, whatever. Um, and I would reach the Stack Overflow and like, go read Advanced R. Like, okay, all right, I have, if I have to. And then I go to Advanced R, I like get through all the boring stuff that I thought didn't apply. And um, as it turns out, like had no idea what was going on. I still like, you know, couldn't figure it out. Couldn't read just that one chapter and figure out what I wanted. So it never like really worked out for me to do that. Um, but eventually like so like when I kind of came back to this I kind of eventually figured out what I wanted um what I wanted to learn out of it which was how do I pass like an object or like a start with call or whatever from the user into the into it like a from like a shiny app into the code run the select or the arrange or the group buys because like group by doesn't take character vectors select does so you can like get around it um but like a lot of the stuff you want you wouldn't want to do you start with a character vector and you got to do something with it but you can't right so now i've learned um how to pass it and i'm gonna sh like i think i showed an example of this i know i was telling you guys about it in the slack before um but uh, whoops that's work <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> Let me know if I need to like delete a second of video or anything. Nah, it's just a team's chat. It's fine. Okay. Um, and so um, basically, previously, so uh, one of the other things I learned was how to do like switch statements. But previously, like, you know, I would have to write a different function for each one of these lines of code where, you know, a certain bid group was type S, which is like a subcontract. Um, or it would be B for a bid rate or P for a part. And this is all like home building stuff that you don't need to care about. But basically the data that came back had this, had a bunch of features that were like keys. Um, so I would be, I, so now I can like use this expression in, um, you know, selects or joins or, um, and just reuse this one expression, you know, bid group bars and then like, um, you know, bang it in and can do any number of grouping and selecting and pivoting and all that fun stuff without having to write a separate function for each one of these um, types, right? So that's like the biggest takeaway um, for me was I came here to learn this and I learned how to do that. So overall, you know, book club success. But like I learned like a ton of other stuff. Um, I can show, I have code examples. I can find code examples for most of these, um, but I figured I'd just run through it. Um, and not take the opportunity to live code for once. Um, so new things, I use the switch function a whole bunch now where I use previously used if, else, this, that, the other thing. Um, Same. Now, sorry? Same, that was a good one. Yeah, um, I use conditional handling. So like try, catch, and um, you know, with a board and so on. Like I write stop messages now to pass the error back to the user of my shiny app. So like I run like I so like I have like a try catch run the main function and then if there's I can actually show you this one sec. Uh, that one. I 
again back into work, but I'm just going to show you this part anyway because I thought it was cool. I think I mentioned this before, but so yeah, so this function is a big wrapper on a whole bunch of like an ETL process. And so now I, inside of an observe event, I try catch this main data function. And then if, I, if there's an error, and usually the errors are ones that I wrote, I make a modal show up, which is, a, which is basically a pop-up uh, box that says, oh no, we found an error and passes the actual error message back to the user. Um, not because the user can deal with it, they sometimes can, they sometimes can't, but it makes it a lot easier for me to debug you know, a thousand, two thousand lines of code. Now it's less, obviously, because I've been condensing it. But it makes it easier for me to like pass this message back and go, "Oh, Tan, you should look for this thing." And so instead of trying to recreate what the user did, I can look at that message and like deduce what they did and where that problem would be, because usually it has some kind of descriptive, um, you know, this function broke or whatever, right? So I can pass this message back to the user of the app. I'm in a small team, so I'm not particularly concerned about the user seeing that it's broken. It helps me to, that they know, so they can tell me this part is broken, this is the message I'm getting, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I can also pass warnings back and so on as well. So conditional handling, um, super useful. Um, environments, I know where it's some, where what an environment is and where and why R would look for something. Uh, so both in function writing and in debugging. And obviously I write a heck of a lot of functions, um, both because I wrote a package and because I like mapping everything. Uh, speaking of mapping everything, I map the crap out of everything and use functions in a lot of different ways. Um, I know what a function factory is. I've never, probably never going to write one. Um, but now I know what to do if a function returns me a function. It doesn't scare me like it used to, where it's like, what, wait, what would do with this? Like, it just returned to me a function, you know, like that, you know, like when you try to run scale dollar format or something, right? Like, you think, oh, it's going to return me, like, you know, a character vector of dollars. No, it doesn't. It returns you a function, which then, you know, applies the format that you want, right? So now it doesn't like scare me because that's like, that's now in the realm of expected behaviors. Um, I know about a series of modifiers to help adjust function behaviors. We mentioned memoize earlier, um, quietly, safely, possibly. Um, and I use try catch as much as I do these, but um, it's, a, it's a good, it's, I do know, how, I know about them so I can use them when, it, when I think it's necessary. Um, I did write a package for S3, moving on to uh, object oriented. So it's cool to minimize the user interface so they don't have to remember as many functions. Um, previously, you know, I would have to write a switch function or manually handle the, um, manually handle a bunch of stuff. Sorry, I'm just reading this. Uh, ETL. Yeah, so I, I, I had a whole ETL process that I manually wrote out. And then just like, so this whole script here is like 600 lines of code, which are functions that are used in ETL. And then I slap it into another function called um, run, main, run the main data, and then call each of these functions in succession. And that's ETL. So like some of these had to be handled separately. So I made like sub functions. In theory, I could have used an S3 class. Um, it's about the same amount of function writing. So, you know, I can go back and change it, but I happen to have functions. I just can kind of continued in this pattern where the get bids calls a switch function that calls each of these functions. Um, theoretically, I could have created an S3 object in this con or in the params or something and pass the params all the way through. Um, but, you know, I just kind of continued on in, with this switch pattern. The wearscape. I don't know what a wearscape is. Okay. It's an ETL tool. It's like an enterprise ETL tool. <laughs> okay. I'll have to look at that later. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, continuing on with things I learned. Um, I'm comfortable using an R6 package. I don't know what I'd reach for it now, but the whole function, like, you know, dollar sign method, that used to scare me because, like, I had no idea why it was doing that or, like, the pattern, like, was very unfamiliar. So now I understand it. It was always, am I, did I accidentally start to use Python? I thought yeah. it was in R. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a weird, it was a weird pattern. It's still kind of weird. I wouldn't reach for it, but now it's, like, 
oh, you know, like um, uh, Waiter, for example, John Cohen's like um, shiny, has like a shiny Waiter package, which is like, you know, it's an R fixed class object that like watches for something and then like shows a loading screen. And then like when the thing's loaded, it like comes back. That's an R6 package. I was hesitant to use it before because it was R6 and I was like, why is it so like weirdly interfaced? Um, but it's normal to me now. Um, I still don't know what S4 is. I, I mean, I know what it is and could present on it if I had to, but I would never reach for it. Um, but I don't think Hadley would either, so it's fine. Um, like I said earlier, um, I know about how to passing how to pass expressions to tidyverse stuff, which is kind of like my number one use of metaprogramming. Um, and I now know where to look in the metaprogramming chapter and how to interpret it so that I can do what I wanted to do if I needed to, which is still very rare, but you know, that's how it goes. Um, lastly, debugging. I now know how to use browser and love it. Um, I also use debug more frequently now, um, debug once, et cetera. And just using that to step through environments is really useful. Um, I still don't do a ton of performance measurement and improvement, even though I'm a shiny developer. Um, eh, small data, I don't care. Um, and I still don't know C++ or RCPP, but I know it's faster. So, you know, that's things Tan learned in almost seven minutes. So my question for you, Tan, is that original question that people on Stack Overflow were like, dude, read the book. Would you be able to answer that question now? Yeah, if that's this, like, how do I like pass, like, when do you need to like bang, bang to like unquote the expression so that it's fed into the, like when you started with like the bang, bang and the unquote bit, my eyes glazed over. And now I don't have to ask, I just do it. Yeah, now we get to make jokes about embrace and all the other wacky things. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so you know, bang, bang, bang is when multiple things come into the party. This is good. It's really good. I can write. And I didn't make it so that I have something to check into the repo, but you know, it's useful. I, I am glad that you did it. <laughs> with the, you know, the meta programming with uh, like bang bang and Nanquo and all that, I think, what was it, the R Studio presentation like a year ago about just passing the dots? That like has solved like, I don't know, 80% of my problems. Uh, <laughs> well, and I feel like I feel comfortable with the meta programming doing you know, the bang bang and all that. but. Uh, you know, like half the time, it's just passing the dots works. <laughs> well, I'd say even if I don't get it right the first time, like I don't, I don't feel like I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm like, oh, right. It, I, I need a bang, bang there because it's quoted here and blah, 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 blah. Like I, it makes sense eventually, even if I get it wrong the first time. <laughs> yeah. And for me, it's like, I can throw a browser inside of the function and just like, observe like what what am i what is the variable that i'm calling and what am i trying to get it to do and i can see like the state of everything before i even like like even if i don't like go back and read the book i'm like oh it like if this is a character it should be an expression this is an expression it should be a call like you know like being able to like see it has been really useful um, just, And yeah, I will stop sharing so that sure. someone else can go. Oh, my dog's that was to awesome. participate. <laughs> <laughs> you can watch a tip stream of me. The dog is applauding. <laughs> Which my dog would applaud. It's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> great. I thought about live coding on a stream like I do on the side and so on i've been i got busier and so like i have and then like obviously like up and down covid things happen yeah, yeah. Lot, right but like <laughs> the beginning of the year i bought like um like a headset and a web, like a good webcam before covid even happened because i was oh. thinking about live coding on a stream <laughs> um, it never happened but i guess like like i it's it's not an unpleasant idea i still don't know how to debug inside a shiny yeah. app i just Put print statements everywhere. So, oh, 
I can. Well, I was gonna say we'll get there. Yeah, we'll That's, get there. Uh, to to master and shiny. We'll yeah, do it right it's now. coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I yeah. I, I'm still not as good at debugging as I would like to be. That's I'm gonna have to go like watch videos a few times and reread that chapter, but I'll get there. I had an actual use case for uh, doing a flame graph or using a flame graph to cause something was running slow. It didn't really help me, but it, it like it, I saw overall there was nothing really specific holding everything back. But I used the flame graph and I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. I know how to do this. <laughs> Very nice. All right. Uh, who's next in the list? Darren, do you have anything to show us? Uh, well, not as much as that. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, well, I learned a lot for sure. Um, the one thing that I would say, like, in terms of actual code is not really even my code. Um, but I, um, I started contributing to a package called Core, C-O-R-R-R. -R -R. <laughs> um, uh, um, so it's a package to examine correlations in, in data sets. So, um, so like for instance, wait, am I sharing? Can I share my screen? You're no. not sharing, but you can. All right, let me try to share. You all see my screen? Mm -hmm. All right, so the core package. Right. And like, um, so something you can do is you can do correlate empty cars, right? So like, um, so, the the core data structure of this package is a uh, core df. Um, let's see. Right. Right. So there's a core df, which is like an S3 class. Um, so just around like 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 when I first started like contributing to it. Um, which is probably like the week after or the, or the second week after we went over like S3. <laughs> so I didn't write much of the code, but like it really helped me in terms of understanding the existing code and in debugging. So, you know, so, for, so, so everything is in terms of this core DF package. So this is what it looks like. So this is a bunch of generics. All right. So I'm kind of disorganized here, right? So here's this arc plot function. I do arc plot df. Okay. So what the arc plot does is is it is it plots these correlations, right? So um, one of the issues that I fixed, well, yeah, I, I can I can say one of the issues that I worked on was changing the arc plot. So the um, so it's written here. So this is the generic in the output that R, and then in the core underscore df dot R, there's a there's a method somewhere. It's got to be <laughs> right. So this is the method, and one of, like so for instance, one of the things is I added this parameter, which is not much. And it failed. And then I was like, okay, yeah, but I have to go back to the generic and yeah. add it to the generic as well. Um, you know, things like that. Um, and then the other thing that I learned from the book is there was another bug in, in the network plot. So the network plot. The network plot makes these well, plots showing like illustrating the correlation between different variables. Um, the network plot function was failing in a particular situation. And what did I do there? Oh, 
yeah, so after I figured out what I was feeling, I had to put in some warnings and to do something else. So like suppress warnings here. And then I have an R-Lang abort and I warn, and you know, those are things I would never have included in my code before reading this book. Um, so yeah, I think that's like the one thing that I learned from the book and it happened to happen like around the time that we were going over the same chapters. So it's in the core package. So, you know, feel free to get it off a crayon or from GitHub. And that's what I did. How does it, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing, period. Um, <laughs> how does it work like contributing to, like I'm so intimidated by our studio approved packages like do you did you first like open an issue and then they're like cool go for it like what's that or oh, do you yeah. just say like here's a pr no um so i was where was um i trying to remember so julia uh came to some group i was in uh some slack channel i i can't remember which one it's, it's either the, the R Studio certified trainers or minorities in R. And she said, you know, we have two packages that we're looking for new maintainers. And, oh. and I said, sure, I'm interested. And so I don't have any official role, but like I just look through the issues and see what I can address. And that's what, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um... and you're not just some rando. Like you, oh, they, it, oh, they're yeah. happy with the brandos. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, they yeah, might like. I just realized that I have a uh, a PR that was started at Tidyverse Dev Day during our studio comp this year for um, recipes, and it is still technically in progress because I was waiting for a review. I had forgotten all about that, but they do, that's why they do t Tidyverse Dev Days. Anyone can submit or can, mm -hmm. can contribute. Um, whether you do it, like the easiest thing is to start with documentation. If you see something that's confusing, fix it, PR it, and they'll thank you for it. But also just go through the issues and find something that, well, I was gonna say find something you think you can, you can do, but you made it through advanced R, so just choose an issue. You can do any of them. Well, yeah, I have a very specific <laughs> thing that I've kind of started working on that is in our markdown, it'd be nice to have in, in the little options that you can specify an alternate text for an image, not a figure caption. Yes. I but I don't know if you're just like, hey, here's a PR or- If it is like a new feature, I would- Not that I even wrote the code for it yet, but yeah. yeah. I'd open an issue for it and make sure that they, you know, don't have something else in mind or whatever. Yeah. Cause I have had those too, where I say, Hey, what do you think about this? And they're like, well, actually here's why we're going to do it this other way. And we've got it already planned out and blah, got blah, it. blah. Um, and then I also had one that was tidyverse dev day, uh, 2019 that we ran into, I had a bug on Roxygen because I was using my Windows machine that I don't use for work and it was set up wrong. And so I fixed that bug so that even if it's set up wrong, it would work. And then there was this whole thing of, well, it was because it was set up wrong, so we're not gonna deal with it. And almost a year later, Jim Hester was like, yeah, but I started using a Windows machine and I had the same problem. So like a year later, Jim Hester resurrected my PR and uh, got it into Roxygen. Um, the point being, yeah, try, <laughs> you know, what's the worst that's going to happen? Right. They'll, they'll reject it. One thing I want to do more is actually contribute to packages, pull requests. Um, I've only done like two, maybe. Uh, one of them was at a tiny dev day, and I think the 2019 one. Yeah, I was oh. there, but I, I, I didn't know you, John, so uh, I guess I didn't meet you. That's uh, funny. That's, that's too bad. <laughs> um. I think uh, the one I worked on there was like cumulative sum in uh, Deplier, and 
it, I like made the fix, and then there was like, you know, I think Hadley was like looking at some of them, and he was like, oh yeah, this is gonna require like uh, you know, C changes or C plus plus changes. So he's like, you know what? Don't even worry about it. I was like, okay. oh. <laughs> that's too bad. Uh, I think, but I think that what I worked on like was right, but then it like revealed like an underlying issue. So I was like, well, at least there was progress here. I'll say uh, it's it is a good idea when you're sometimes it can happen like I was the other day I was working on a plumber project and I was getting very confused with the documentation because it seemed to suggest I could do something that it wasn't allowing me to do and and turned out you know in submitting a uh, or trying to look into whether the documentation was right at all it turned out it was a bug in it was a bug in the way it was coded and sort of in the intention of what you were supposed to be able to do. And they were actually really quick to get a fix put out for that. So even documentation fixes can lead to bug fixes. Yeah, I made an issue for package down and it's still like, I think highly agreed with me, but like Jim Astor was like, it, solving a problem it's supposed to he wrote code to solve a specific problem but then um basically was having problems like redeploying um a package down site from my computer and it kept rewriting my git configs um because i think jim hester had written the code as if it was going to be done from like a travis ci build um but he also someone else or he did or whatever wrote a, wrote that he wanted us to use this function to, to push the website live from your local machine and not from CICD. So it's like two converse things and I don't think it's been resolved yet, but I haven't like rebugged him in the two months since. So yeah, I, I think like I opened an issue. I could rewrite the code, but like, you know, what can you do? All right. Uh, yeah. Do you have anything to show us, Tyler? I was trying to think. I, I do have some things I can show you. I was kind of trying to think back that, you know, going through uh, this book, I'd say nothing. There wasn't a lot of stuff that I'd say that was completely uh, new other than maybe like S4 and some of the RCPP stuff, but it definitely helped to solidify a lot of the ideas and kind of like what everyone's saying. Uh, I have used Rlang in the past and, you know, very trial and error, uh, trying just different functions until it does what I need it to do. And I think I've kind of moved beyond that phase now, uh, not entirely, but in, in a lot of ways, I can, at least on the first go, usually reason out what needs to happen, what functions to use the way. Um, and it's just been very helpful, uh, you know, from a learning experience, you really don't know it until you can uh, explain it to someone else. So that's why I kind of been taking tack of just answering every question that I can and kind of going off on my own little tangents, trying to uh, explore what's happening. Um, so it, that has been a, a big positive going, going through this group and, um, yeah, I can show some things. I, I try to go back and think like, I know I've done stuff in the past year. Uh, a lot of it is unfortunately stuff for my work that I can't, uh, share directly, but let's see. So I guess I'll just kind of go through some, uh, some stuff that I had done before and kind of worked on and improved upon as we've been going through some of this stuff. Uh, let's see. Uh, so one very R-Lang kind of heavy uh, package that I worked on was I, I wanted a way to somewhat like conflicted um, 
where you can choose which function to use from a, a given package. I wanted to temporarily execute code uh, from a, another uh, environment, um, basically to sort of intercept function calls and uh, use a different function. So for one good example, there's a, a package called tidy log that will allow you to uh, to run dplyr calls and then it kind of does a self-reporting where it'll show you how many rows were added or dropped, columns added, dropped, things like that. Um, but my problem is, is like, in order to use it, you have to load, you have to load the tidy log package and it kind of supersedes the dplyr calls and it intercepts it and then sort of forwards the, the things to the dplyr. And in addition to that, as a problem that if I, you know, I'm very commonly, I ex am explicit with my uh, namespace um, declarations. And if I do something like this, then I can't use tidy log um, because it's I'm forcing it to use the dplyr version. Um, but the mask package that I put in will hopefully work. And so there I run this code and it has uh, run it masking this expression uh, using tidy log. Um, and this has a nice benefit that I can run this even if it's you know inside of another function that, that does the explicit scoping. Um, and it's just hand, I, to be honest, I don't even I, you know I don't even have to have dplyr or, or tidy log open. I can just do a fresh restart and think this will work. Should have all this stuff shortcutted, but yeah. So you know you don't have to load the uh, load the library. You can just execute it. And basically, what it's doing is uh, it's building an environment. Uh, to execute this code in, and it's actually uh, in a parent environment looking for any of the functions in one uh, namespace to override the functions in another namespace. Um, but it also is intercepting the colon colon and triple colon calls and uh, trying to handle those. So. Did I something called colonoscopy? Yes, uh, that's that's another, uh, to be honest, that one's in kind of a mixed state. Like I said, I, I do a lot of work where I'm, I'm explicit with my namespace and I want to do that in the end, like I want to have everything scoped uh, that, you know, within reason, um, but sometimes I'm just, I code really fast and then I forget to do that and I wanted the ability to kind of just run over my code and add in all the all, all the namespaces that I forgot to declare. Um, and so, so that's what uh, colonoscopy does. So um, it, it will look at what, what in, uh, libraries you've loaded. Let's say here, just so I can say that it has been loaded, library dplyr. Um, can unscope it first to remove the scopes. I need to change it so it doesn't deselect. Uh, but then to rescope it, scope selection, uh, it'll find it and then add in the namespace back on top of it. Um, so, so I'm not just undoing things. I can. All right, let's go unscope to get fresh. And so I've loaded library, I loaded uh, dplyr and per and scope in. So it finds walk and per and puts it back on. Um, originally I had it, so I mean, it was actually fairly um, intricate because you can do, you know, how does it handle when uh, you make a function that has an argument that's the same name as uh, a as a method or an object in one of those packages. You know, how do you track which one's which? And I, I, I originally in an earlier commit, I had it working where, uh, you know, it would it would 
even keep track of the arguments that have been defined in sort of higher level uh, function bodies, or even, you know, it, lo it looks for assignments and, and things like that. And, and then in, it sort of carries an internal um, mask to say, no, don't, this thing no longer represents the, uh, or it's no longer going to scope to the, um, <laughs> to the library, but uh, it's, it's, it's complicated. Um, the, the colonoscopy thing is a, is a mess of R6 classes. Um, it does lots of recursion, trying to, to find these different elements and, and pull it out. But, um, but it, it, uh, it, it's neat, something I wanna work on and more at some point, but um, around the time that this started, I was really just playing around a lot with uh, how you can manipulate environments and use that to, uh, to do neat things. Um, so, you know, what does the, the mask look like? I mean, the, 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 the add-in is just calling this tidy log mask on the expression. And, uh, I guess a good example this is using a function factory um, plus a little more. So this tidy log mask function will generate a mask uh, that is going to uh, use the tidy log namespace to mask functions coming out of dplyr and tidyr um, and generate <laughs> mask builds a, a number of environments and uh, to be honest, it's been a long time since I looked at it, so I'm not sure I can remember uh, exactly uh, what the uh, functioning of everything is. But it, it, in essence, it's kind of building a, uh, you know, like a Russian doll type nesting of environments. Um, in each environment, we'll have some sort of extra little piece, either the, the masking environment or the piece that does the intercepting of the colon and things like that. And then uh, it will either change the environment of the function if you're passing in a function, or uh, it will change the, uh, um, it'll execute it in this masking environment. So I, to ask, I don't know if this works. Uh, let's see. Uh, so I can do something like tidy log mask, uh, dplyr select, and I'll call that just F, B, unused argument. No, nope. oh, whoops. That's right. See, I'm remembering how to use my own packages. Make the mask, and then uh, let's call it S. Mask dplyr select. It says, says, hey, we're masking this thing, and now I can just use that. I don't, I can just use the uh, masked version of this function. Uh, which I don't know if that's helpful or not, but um, yeah, uh, let's see what else. Yeah, so the colon interceptors, to be honest, it'd take, it'd take a while to kind of go through, I guess, whatever, what everything <laughs> is happening here. Um, it's on my GitHub, I think, this version is on there, so you kind of see what it's what it's doing. Um, but that that was fun. Double underscore intercept. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is it? Yeah, we got it. We have these intercepting environments to intercept the colon calls. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, I was inspired by. Gosh, I think it was. Uh, what's his name? Cool, but useless yeah. handle. Uh, it has a GG reverse package where you, you can give it a GG plot object and it will reverse and reproduce like as best it can the code to produce that graph. Um, and so this is this was kind of a similar idea, except I want to take an R6. Uh, I want to take an R6 class uh, class generator specifically and reproduce the code that made that um, 
from uh, it itself. And it's actually a fairly straightforward thing because, um, you know, the R6, any of the R6 objects are just environments. Um, so it's a matter of just kind of going through the environments and then piecing back together uh, the, you know, the expression for, for the class. So uh, let's see. I think I have everything loaded here. So I could do something like R6. Let's debug. So I'm going to D must be a function. It is a function. <laughs> Should I rename it somewhere? No. Yeah, it's complaining because I did things. <laughs> All right. Well. Is this yeah, is. R6, R6 verse? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I do not understand this. I have it. No, oh, there we go. Uh, so let's say we do like R6 class definition dplyr data mask. All right, so step into the braces, go through the dispatch. Now we're in the class generator call. Make sure that's actually not necessary. This, this was before I changed it to S3. Presumably, <laughs> if it got here, it was an R6 class generator to begin with. But, um, right. So what is X? X is the X is that R6 generator, um, which is really just a environment of a bunch of different things that make up that, and we just kind of have to extract out of this all the pieces we need in order to reproduce the, the, the call. So uh, first thing, get the class name if it exists. Uh, it could be null, you don't have to have a class name. Uh, and then we can get the public information. So let's go into the public and you can see X public fields. Well, this one doesn't have anything, but it probably has public methods. So it has all these functions in its public methods. Uh, if it had nothing, we'll just return null. Otherwise, uh, we're going to return this expression <laughs> that is going to uh, see. And things like here, like I don't want to step into all those different uh, uh, methods. So. You know, my standard practice when debugging is I'll, I'll be constantly debug one thing, things that I want to get into further down the line. Um, so I can just continue now and wait till it evaluates the public methods piece. And I'll be inside of there. Right, and so again, we've pat we're still looking at our X as our class. Um, but I want to pull out the public methods and I want to, uh, I want to uh, get rid of the clone method because the clone method is something that if it's there is usually is not generated by the user. It's an automatically added field uh, or function. So get rid of that. And then uh, if we have anything left, we'll return it. Otherwise, we'll return null. Uh, which to be honest, I, I you know, one thing I love in Arlang is it has the, the percent double bar percent for right if it's null null or two right so to return the the first thing that's not null um, I kind of want the opposite of that that I, I I have a number of cases where I want to if something is uh, null then I want it to return null. Otherwise, I want it to return something else if it's not null. But um, so, yeah, there. So now we have public. Public is just a, uh, is this uh, class public? Okay, it's a call uh, because we called it as an expression. Um, and 
the active and private kind of do exactly the same things. And then next, we're going to use the, the call to method to actually create the call that produces our uh, class. And so if we look at our R6 class call, I should have chosen a smaller class. Uh, this has a lot of stuff in it. Um, we can see like it's a, you know it's kind of how this class would have been defined in the source code without the uh, comments and everything. Uh, if it's null, if the name doesn't exist, then uh, we're going to return just the R6 class without any assignment. If it did have a name, then we're going to want to reflect that because that's kind of how that name kind of came about. So it has a name, so we're going to make an expression that is uh, assigning our class definition call to the, the name that we extracted. And and that finishes the function, and then what comes out is a call, right? The data mask is assigned to R6 class, and there's the name of it. I suppose it doesn't, this name is not always the same thing as that name, it doesn't have to be, but convention is it would. And uh, this is, I guess, John, why I was asking about ways to do a pretty styling of R6, because right. when it default prints these, it's ugly. Like this is not how you would write R6 classes, how you would code it. Um, but this is a, you know, a fully formed uh, R6 class that, with everything I've tested, will duplicate what was um, the original class, uh, and has no real purpose. Um, cause I can't, I, I, I couldn't really think of a, a, you know, a good reason why you would ever want to do this. I mean, if you, like, if you have, well, I, I love that because like, who were you inspired by? He goes by yeah. cool, but yeah. useless. Yeah. And, uh, uh yeah, <laughs> I, I did sort of, because one thing is, uh, you know, there, there are different ways of def, def, like developing R6 classes. You can do it all in one call like this, where you have you list all the public methods and all the private methods and all that stuff, or you can do it sort of piecemeal where you use the, um, the set operator on the class to, to generate new, new methods. And, uh, and I didn't know, like, I didn't want to have to go manually piece everything back together to make it look like the uh, sort of standard method. I'm like, well, I wonder if I can take the class I've already built out of this this other way and reconstruct the code get into this way. So, like, I turned a probably a ten minute menial task into a few hour uh, diversion. Um, <laughs> very very common. Yes. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. Uh, I I think that's where we have to end this recap because that, I mean, yep. no one no one needs to follow Tyler. Ha, 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 ha.